Senator Lemus, do you have any further questions? You no, know, I do, and thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and I just, uh, Ms. Mancini and Mr. Green, if you could please, where, where do the credit unions fit in this? Um, they're taxed differently than banks. They're tax advantaged. They're not for, for profits. So they should be able to um, address some of these small lending issues uh, in a way that uh, is still beneficial uh, to their uh, tax advantage status, whereas banks uh, maybe less so uh, because they have to factor in the tax component of their uh, business. Why aren't credit unions helping out here? Senator Loomis, I'll try to take a start on that. I think that some credit unions are more willing to make smaller dollar mortgages than a lot of banks, but we still don't see a lot of that. And, and it's something I'd be happy to follow up with and try to get a bit more insight. Um, but I believe that the origination costs and the compensation structures, even at credit unions, um, tend to make it difficult below $100,000. Um, and if Mr. Green, he, you may know more. Yeah, I would concur with that point. I think that um, below a certain threshold, the, the proportionate, the fixed costs proportionately just make it much less desirable. Um, and I think that inadvertently, some of the some of the the result of the qualified mortgage rules that are uh, part and parcel to Dodd Frank make for small balance mortgages uh, it a little more difficult to carry those costs in quite the same way um, that you would um, in, in terms of uh, the ways that uh, that mortgages are originated. And so um, the incentive um, lies much more on the other side of, of the ledger, particularly um, during the sort of market that we've had over the, the previous 10 years, right, where refinance activity and uh, lowering interest rates made it much easier, much more attractive. Um, just the opportunity cost of doing larger loans didn't leave a lot of oxygen in the room for smaller smaller balanced loans. So Mr. Green, would it be advisable to us for us to consider a carve out from Dodd-Frank for small sized mortgages that provide a lesser regulatory burden and therefore a greater financial incentive for financial institutions to land below the $100,000 level? Yes, I think there, there, there are some provisions um, that exist, but I think there are some nuanced considerations to be able to um, incorporate reasonable costs to be able to, uh, so that organizations like ours don't have to fully absorb the, the cost of doing that or disproportionately absorb the cost of doing that mm -hmm. um, and to be able to roll those into, into loans. I would also point out that there are also some practical dynamics in the market, things like appraisal gaps that exist um, given the lack of liquidity in these markets. There just tend to be fewer transactions, so pegging price tends to be harder. And so on the margins, it's more difficult to transact in this property market uh, segment. Um, and, and as a function of that, you have to do things to grease the wheels to be able to make it more likely that transactions can occur. Do you have competition in your business model? I mean, are there other firms like you out there? I think our, our competition is not necessarily firms that do what we do. It's firms that would acquire to do the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. that, would, mm -hmm. that, would, that would hold. There's not a lot of incentive for groups, unfortunately, like um, the players in Minnesota who have um, targeted the Somali populations to sell to groups like ours uh, after having received large down payments and having a significant equity cushion. Um, and so for us, um, it's, it's less that uh, there are groups that are seeking to do what we do. Uh, it's uh, groups that would acquire the same properties and seek to, um, to perform essentially um, what, we've, what we're all here to, to talk about today in terms of churning families, um, squeezing them, um, and charging high, high interest rates to be able to have high cash yielding investments. Are there federal barriers to your the success of your business model at uh, Blackstar? I would say that, uh, that, that we encounter less in the way of, of barriers um, so much as we would benefit from tailwinds that would be uh, associated with more, more vigorous enforcement actions. Okay. Um, 
we may want to, I may want to visit with you about this more, but we can do that uh, offline to explore some of those uh, advantages that may accrue to incentivize a business like yours uh, to uh, provide consumer information. Do you, and I might ask that as my final question, do you educate consumers as part of your business model? We do. Part of the part of our business model relies on trust building. Um, we are coming in uh, to an environment where there is, for for many obvious reasons, a deficit of trust. And so, uh, a big part of what we have to do initially is to distinguish ourselves from our predecessors. Um, and part of that is helping to educate them on the instrument that they have, the deficiencies of it, and why a traditional mortgage would benefit them, why having the headache of applying and why doing it with us is fundamentally different than the process before. So yes, that education is a big part of, 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 of what we do. Senator, I'm sorry, could I make one very quick point about QM? Is that all right? Absolutely, if, 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 is that? Sure, if the chairman's okay with <laughs> it. Okay. okay, thank you. I just wanted to address the question about carve-outs because I, I really appreciate the collaborative spirit of thinking of various options. I did just want to point out that already the QM structure has different allowances for smaller dollar loans, like the points and fees threshold and um, APR thresholds are higher for smaller dollar loans. So there is already a built-in understanding about those mm -hmm. fixed costs. And of course, we should be cautious about removing key protections. I also think that a lot of the fixed costs of originating mortgages is aside from compliance. You know, there are just things that have to be paid for. Um, but I think there is a, a benefit to more study about the costs of origination, mm -hmm. the way loan officers are compensated often as a percentage of the principal balance is another factor. And there are some banks that pay their, uh, their loan officers a salary in certain departments like for uh, community economic development. And that has led to more lending, uh, more small dollar lending as well. That's interesting. I was going to actually, I appreciate that. And I was going to um, ask uh, Ms. Mancini, just as we wrap up here, um, uh, looking into, I mean, just to pursue this a bit more, the fixed costs associated with mortgages are the things, are, are partly to pay for the things that protect buyers and sellers potentially. I mean, making sure that there's an appraisal on the property so that you're not paying five times more. Um, making sure that they're doing a, a title search to make sure that there aren't liens on the property that the buyer is unaware of. Um, uh, doing a, a is that, could you just maybe talk a bit more about what some of those what contributes to some of that fixed cost? Absolutely, and you've named a few. So the title search and the closing attorney will get you to at least a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars right off the bat, and those are very important. Really, no one should purchase a home without having a lawyer do a title search to make sure the person selling it actually has good title. Um, and then you know there are there are uh, some, sometimes the inspection. There's the recording fees and the deed records. So there really are a number of flat fees that are hard to eliminate. We do know that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as part of their equitable housing finance plans, have been looking closely at closing costs and, and mm -hmm. with an eye towards whether any of them can be reduced. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Well, um, seeing no further questions for our um, our panel, um, I want to um, thanks thanks so much to our witnesses for um, being here today and for providing testimony, both those of you in person and also um, Ms. Goodell calling in remotely from Minnesota. Um, I'm interested in the conversation today. We are hearing a lot about sort of the interplay between state and federal law and how um, that can work together, how it really should be supporting um, each other. Um, what we can do to try to make it um, you know, address the incentives around providing mortgages for smaller dollar mortgages, which would then reduce the demand for these kinds of exploitive contracts for deed, um, and uh, many other, I think, good ideas for us to start thinking about. Um, and I would like to just say that I look forward to the continuing to work with um, our colleagues on this and um, work towards some common sense solutions that we can, uh, that we can work on together. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, if it's not recorded, the contract for deed cannot be enforced. I think that's a, a, a really uh, smart idea. Yep. Uh, so we've heard some really good ideas today. So thank you very much again for your testimony. 
For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, which will be Tuesday, July 18th. For witnesses, you will have 45 days to respond to any questions for the record. Thank you again so much for your testimony. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.